Hi, welcome back to a Yin Yoga podcast. Welcome back to returning listeners. Hello, if you're new around here, before we get started, a couple of things that you should know about this podcast. The thoughts and opinions of my guests are their own. I may or may not agree with them. I value new information, diverse points of view, and critical thinking. And so it's with this intention that I share these conversations. Also, good to know, these are adults having adult conversations, which may include difficult subject matter. These are people sharing their own stories. So there may be abuse, addiction, trauma, eating disorders, mental health, et cetera. So if you're currently working through any of that, please take good care of yourself. And I will do my best to leave um, disclaimers in the actual show notes. You can also expect some adult language. So if you have little ones around, grab some headphones now. And let's dive into today's episode. So if I were to tell you that I was excited about our guest today, that would be only the slightest understatement. It would be a massive understatement. Today's guest is Paul Gurley. And I'll talk more about Paul Gurley and my relationship to him and how I came to study with him as we go into the interview. But I also have done that in my previous two episodes. Um, so before we get into hanging out with Paul, um, I'll just read his bio. Paul Gurley began practicing yoga in 1979 after reading Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansma Yogananda. He moved to Los Angeles in 1982, where he studied and taught yoga for 12 years. In 1988, he read Theories of the Chakras by Dr. Hiroshi Motiyama. Paul and his wife Susie have been active students of Dr. Motiyama ever since. Paul started his studies of anatomy with Dr. Gary Parker in 1979 and continued his studies at UCLA, where he took courses in anatomy and kinesiology. He earned an MA from St. John's College in Santa Fe in the summer of 2000 and an honorary PhD in 2005 from the California Institute of Human Science for his efforts to clarify the latest theories on fascia and its relevant to the practice of Hatha yoga. Paul's written two books and created three videos detailing the influence of anatomy on asana practice. After teaching yoga asana for 40 years, Paul now spends most of his time reading science and esoteric literature with a focus on Samkhya philosophies of India. He and his wife occasionally teach yoga and meditation retreats, and you can visit their website for more about that, and that's paulgrilly.com, which of course I will have in the episode notes. Okay. So to say that I'm excited, huge understatement. Um, And the next time that you hear back from me, I'll be with Paul. Hi, Paul. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for for coming and hanging out with me. Um, Just briefly, I'm going to just talk about how I found you and how you became one of the few people in the world that I call my teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I would love to dive right into the, the interview. So I'm going to give a very Reader's Digest version. Um, I found your DVD in a bookstore back when, you know, we actually went to bookstores to buy books. And when I had graduated my first 300-hour training, uh, it was very clear to me that there were some holes in my knowledge, anatomy and sequencing, where I was like, um, I'm not quite clear on these things. And so off I went to the bookstore, picked up your Anatomy for Yoga DVD, you know, old school when we actually still (laughs) watch things on DVD. And I, you know, dove into it. I watched it repeatedly, probably, probably about four or five times and was completely blown away um, for a few reasons. One, because you explained some things in my own body that my previous training was an Iyengar based training. No one could ever explain. So when I would, so for example, I'm in, I'm genetically quite internally rotated. So in extended side angle pose, I would get this sharp pinching in my hip because of the orientation of my pelvis and then the leg externally rotating. And I would ask repeatedly, 
teachers, why is this happening? Like if I bring my hand to the floor, pinching. If I keep my elbow on my leg, fine. If I bring my hand to a block, fine. But nobody had an explanation. They used to tell me it was tight hips. It's like, that's, that's like my only flexible area on my body naturally. So, so I was, there were questions that were not answered and there were rules that had been put on me with this internal rotation. So for example, in saddle or supta for those of you who speak Hatha, um, I would naturally want to turn my feet out to get out of the bone of my foot digging into the floor. And it was super comfortable for me to do so, but then they would come over and poo poo me and put lots of furniture under me and strap my legs together and all the things so that I was like now in this like massively supported version going, okay, but aren't I going to be expected to do wheel soon? And like, I haven't opened my quads at all because you've got me all like boosted up. So those were some of the problems. And when I saw your DVD presentation, it, it just, I was like, Eureka. So it's changed the way, obviously, I saw my own body, but then it also changed the way I saw my students. No longer when I started giving a just general direction and noticed that not everybody was doing the same thing, did I think it was because they didn't hear me or they didn't understand me? I was like, oh, maybe that doesn't work in their body. Oh, okay, cool. So it changed that. And um, so I was super grateful for that. And then one day I was walking down the street and I stuck my head into a studio that I never went to because it was an Ashtanga studio just to go and look and see if they had a bolster to buy. And I saw a poster on their cork board with your mug on it. And it said anatomy and yin yoga workshop. And I was like, oh my God, that's the guy from my DVD. And I, just by fate, it was uh, on a weekend that I actually had off because it was summer. I normally taught on Saturdays, so I didn't have to get a sub or anything. And so I just went right upstairs and was like, I'll sign up. I had no idea what Yitten was. I'd never heard of it. I just knew that if I got that much from your DVD, that a workshop would be probably epic. So that's how I found you. And then I fell in love throughout that practice. Some of the biggest takeaways were just the feeling, which anyone who's done yin yoga knows that feeling that you can't really name in your body. But also a big takeaway was that you did not correct my alignment. Which for me was like, <laughs> so I would be in, I would be in saddle and I'd be like, my feet would be complaining and I'd want to turn them out. And I'd be like, oh, if I do that, I'm just going to, I'm so programmed that I was going to get a lecture. And finally I was just like, there's no way I can hold this for five minutes if I don't turn my feet out. So I turned my feet out and the whole time laying there waiting, waiting, waiting for you to come over and be like, burr, burr, burr. but you didn't. And then afterwards, I remember asking you about that and you said, well, if you genetically have that ability in your body to do so comfortably, then it's fine. And I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. So <laughs> it's the little things. <laughs> it's right. It's all about saddle pose. Yes. Um, so yeah, I fell in love with this style, started practicing it, bought your DVD, bought your books, did all the things, um, started practicing it uh, several times a week, kind of in conjunction with my Hatha practice. And then at one point, a few years later, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue and I was teaching 10 classes a week. And so the energy that I had to physically do anything really was getting me to the class and back and the odd demo in a pose to come back out. So at that point, my practice actually shifted from mostly Hatha with a couple yin a week and then maybe yin if I was on my moon cycle or not feeling well to exclusively yin with a side of restorative on my moon cycle. <laughs> and so it totally changed my relationship to the practice because it was so immersive. It was like almost three years of that, of just yin. Um, and then that's when I decided, um, and if listeners have heard my, my hello episode, they'll have heard this already, but I decided at that point when I got a little money from surprise money from my parents that I was like, I know exactly what I'm doing with this. And that's when I came to study with you. So now fast forward, <laughs> there's my backstory. What I would love to know, I think that people's origin story of how they came to yoga is always endlessly fascinating. So I would love to start there with you with um, what brought you to yoga, when, where, when, how, all of the details of that. and did you love it right away 
or did it grow on you? We'll start with that maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah. My origin story is uh, 1978. I was on summer break from college, uh, first year of college and uh, waiting for the second year. And I was working as a laborer, construction laborer, and we were out of town. I grew up in Montana and we were out of town at a town away from us, which meant you know, it's summer, you're working 10 hour days. And because you're away from home, you're trying to earn money and not stay too long in a hotel. It was six days a week, as I remember, maybe it was seven, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, because there's nothing else to do. And, you, and you're burning money for every hotel night that you're there. So I remember that distinctly going like, man, <laughs> this is hard. And uh, at the same time, I had picked up a book on someone's recommendation called The Autobiography of a Yogi. Um, and so I was reading that at night, you know, you'd come home, you know, by the time you ate and showered and laid down, it's eight, nine o'clock at night. And all of my comrades and colleagues, there's like three or four of us in a hotel room, you know, I'm like on a cot and, you know, they're like, read a little bit and then poof, you know, they're sleeping to get up, you know, to get rested after a hard, long, hard, hot day. And I'm reading this book and I'm just getting blown away. I can, re I can remember it so vividly, which is so easy for me to tell my origin story because it's so vivid to me that I'd be reading this book and just every page, everything was like a new world was like, are you kidding? It's like, what? I didn't know that. What? Um, I can remember telling myself, I've got to put this book down and go to sleep or I'm going to be just dead tomorrow. And it was like that for the entire week that I was there. I was completely enthralled. I'd be working all day and I'd be thinking, man, I'm going to read that book again tonight. And then, you know, I'd be up another hour and a half two, two and a half hours, you know, just reading this book. And that was my origin story as an introduction to yoga. But it was the yoga of, of Paramahansa Yogananda. You know, it's Kriya Yoga. It's circulating energies in your spine to slowly develop the ability to withdraw into the spine and we work through your karma and have a samadhi experience you know it wasn't a hatha yoga in any way it was just yoga um but as i think as at least it was in my day this was true it's sort of like oh okay well i'm gonna get into yoga I signed up for a series of lessons from uh, Yogananda's organization. Yogananda, for those of you who don't know, he died in 1951, I think. But there's an organization that he founded and everything that goes on to the day and propagates his teachings. And so I, I signed up for those lessons, but it was like, well, what else can I do that's yoga? So everything yoga and everything India in 1978 in Montana in a small town that I could find, which was not very much, um, I wanted to do. And of course, I, when I went to the local bookstore, there's like three books on yoga. And um, I think one was, uh, I think Light on Yoga. I remember the big silver book, you know. I pulled that off the shelf. I flipped through it and I saw this guy doing all these bizarre contortions. I just closed the book. He shut it back on the shelf and says, I don't want to do any of that. <laughs> And then this much simpler book, which I still have a volume today. I'm staring at it on my bookshelf. It was called Yoga and Health. And it was written by a guy way back in the 60s. He's an Indian guy, South India, but he uh, had migrated to Europe um, like pre-World War II. And he had he learned yoga as a very young man in India. And then when he migrated for reasons I don't remember, I think he went to Hungary or something or Italy um he was already teaching yoga and so he and this other woman who had who many many years ago was quite well known um they wrote this book together mostly him called yoga and health and this was a very 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 simple book that if you've ever had a chance to see books written in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s you know very simple book uh, had an outline of lessons at the back that was a combination of what we would now call yin yoga floor poses for the most part, held for long periods of time, repeated two or three times, maybe six or seven asanas, and then maybe two pranayama practices. And I said, oh, this is great. You know, this will supplement my meditation practices. And I tell that story because I did that for about three or four months. 
And I just, my interest in, in Hatha yoga, as we understand it, doing poses and doing pranayama, was like, well, I was young, I was in my 20s, I was an ex-athlete, kind of lifting weights guy, so it was attractive to me. But there was nothing that I was aware of that you could earn a living teaching yoga. That's like saying I'm going to, well, it's hard to say anything now because you can earn a living teaching anything. <laughs> but in those days, it was like, I'm going to earn a living teaching surfing. And it's like, really? I don't, I don't think so. Does anybody do that? And uh, from the end of summer of 78, August, September, and I can remember it specifically, this origin story, there's some landmark dates in my mind that right near the end of that same year, I've been doing Hatha yoga for uh, three, four months, and I've been you know, taking these lessons that are more in-depth philosophy. I came across Bikram Chowdhury's yoga book, which I think it was called Bikram's Yoga at the time. I, I can't remember, it was an orange book. Actually, someone just brought it in to the community, community college class that I was at and, and says, hey, I heard you're into yoga. And I go, oh yeah, I'm really getting to it. And says, well, here's this book. And it was uh, Bikram's book. And I flipped the book open and the inside cover was a picture of Yogananda and his younger brother. Now his number, younger brother is Bishnu Ghosh because Yogananda's given name was Mukunda Ghosh. Well, Bishnu Ghosh was Bikram's teacher. And so this typical, these fantasy stories we tell ourselves about how we're all interconnected to the universe. Oh, this is a message. The fact that this person who didn't know me brought this book in and here it is, it's Yogananda's picture and his brother taught this guy. Oh my God, it's, this is the Hatha Yoga that's in the Yogananda tradition. Well, it took me a while to figure out that wasn't true at all, but that was the reasoning. It's like, oh, okay, so now all of a sudden, because of this philosophical prejudice I had, that, oh, this is the Yogananda view of Hatha Yoga, it, in my mind, took much more importance. Now it's like, oh, so these postures and these pranayamas are very important. And so I started doing that, and I remember the date that I, I got the book just before Christmas break, and I made a resolution that I was going to do the practice in that book every day for 30 days. And that's what I did. And um, that was my entrance into that origin story of about four months from about the middle of 1978 to the beginning of 1979. I got blown open to the spiritual world of yoga, its deeper philosophies. And then I slid from there into the Hatha uh, yoga world. And that was my origin story of how I went from just, you know, I'm just a boy from Montana to I'm interested in bizarre things. <laughs> so that book, you know, completely um, changed the arc of my life. Yeah, I've, I've read that book a couple of times and it's, uh, to say it's mind blowing would be kind of understating it, hey? It's <laughs> yeah. just like, and I was already, I was already through my first yoga teacher training when I read it and I was still like what um, wow. so yeah I can see how yeah it would be so you've got those yoga books and you're mostly doing home practice at this point yeah there's no oh. yoga classes I mean, what are you talking about right especially in smaller communities this is 1978 in a small community not in a city you know it's like yoga classes what are you talking about Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so where did you go from so what were you studying in university well it was just a uh, community college and uh one of the literally one of the uh aftershocks of reading that book was i wanted to change my major of what i was studying in college um I, you know, as a freshman there's not much to change you're just taking general ed courses and stuff but nonetheless i had started a, a a series of courses that you have to take like in mathematics and chemistry and things like that and i said no no i want to do something physical i want to do something like maybe chiropractic you know, being a doctor was way beyond my thought or reach i thought both financially and maybe even skillfully i don't know if i could you know sustain the grind of the study it takes to get there but I thought, you know, maybe I could reach out and, you know, you know, um, get some form of, of physical certification that wouldn't be quite, you know, to the medical profession range. 
So I had re-enrolled at a local college rather than one I was at before and taking anatomy classes. And that's what I was doing then. So um, when I read that book, as soon as the work season was over, I announced to my parents who were probably shocked or didn't really care, whatever. I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to shift over. I'm going to start taking biology and anatomy. And fortunately, we had excellent biology and anatomy um, some of the best classes I ever took in all of my career at this little community college very close to me. And um, it was uh, an excellent, excellent introduction to anatomy, all its mechanics. And so I started studying anatomy parallel with, you know, doing my home practice. And I started teaching within three months of, of or five months of doing my own practice. Because one, I wasn't intimidated by the practice. It's just practice. It's like, hey, I'm surfing. I'll teach you how to surf. I'll teach you what I know. It didn't have the uh, sort of onus on it today that young teachers have to deal with, which is unfortunate. Agreed. Um, and so it's like, look, I want to practice. And if I, if I commit to having to teach some of my friends, then I have to show up. Because it's hard to keep going in your room by yourself and no one knows what you're doing or cares. And so I started teaching somewhere around, you know, spring 1979. And it was like, it was right up front. I go, look, I don't know anything. I just come from an athletic background. I know my body. I have a fairly good idea of how these things work. And I'm starting to get, you know, some theoretical underpinnings in anatomy and physiology. And fortunately, you know, you know how it is at college. It's like, oh, okay, I'll try that. I had, you know, half a dozen people or more. It grew very quickly. Of people going like, okay, I'm interested. You know, I don't care if you're not Joe certified yoga because there was no Joe certified yoga. That was the huge advantage. There was no someone going to tap on your shoulder and say, are you certified to do this? It was like, Hey, do whatever. It's like you don't need you didn't need to be certified to play basketball at the Y. You didn't need to be certified to go out and try to learn surfing. You didn't need to be certified to humbly explore yoga and share it with your friends. So it was a very easy for me in my generation and my time and place to just I think yoga's cool. I like it. I want to share it with others. And so by 1979, a year later, I'd already been teaching for six months, had a year of anatomy and physiology under my belt, and was starting to look more seriously at some of the other uh, yoga books and resources that were out there, Hatha yoga books and resources. Very cool. So did you just kind of continue on that way, doing some university and teaching and, and building the teaching from there? Uh, no, I went down to L.A. to study with Bikram at with Bikram at Bikram School. I actually went down to see what was the more realistic um, goal for me. Should I study acupuncture theory, which California had just licensed schools to do it, or should I go off into yoga? And so I went down there uh, again. This would have been summer of seventy nine. I went down to L.A. To, with a list of, of yoga schools, I, I mean, uh, acupuncture schools, there were two of them there at the time that I wanted to visit and take classes at Bikram Child Rees Yoga School in Beverly Hills because, you know, his guru was Yogananda's brother. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I got down there and I visited these schools and I just, you know, you know how it is with schools. Like, well, you know, yeah, it'd be great to be an acupuncturist, but I got to find an apartment in LA, which is five times as expensive as my little town. And oh, and I also have to come up with tuition for the program. And oh yeah, and you have to support yourself as a 20 year old with no skills whatsoever. There's not a chance I'm gonna move to LA, get a job to support myself and get an apartment and pay for school and go to acupuncture school. And so pretty much, even though I was always like intrigued by acupuncture and in fact, my college professor who introduced, who taught the anatomy course that was so transformative for me. He encouraged me to look into acupuncture. He himself, PhD in, in uh, anatomy, um, thought that acupuncture was a fascinating study. And again, in 1978, no one knew anything about it. So the fact that he recommended it and these schools had just come online, I thought that was the path I was gonna go. And once again, 
It's because the idea that you could earn a living teaching yoga was like saying, I'm going to fly to the moon. I'd never heard of it. I'd never heard of anyone doing it. But when I got to LA, I saw that there wasn't just Bikram school, but there was two other schools in LA uh, that were earning a living, that people were, people were coming and taking yoga classes, not practicing yoga on their own. So this is for the people of today, the students of today, it's maybe hard for you to get your head wrapped around. There were no yoga classes. You did yoga on your own, like hiking and rock climbing and surfing. If you were lucky, you had a friend who was interested or you were a crazy shave your head member of a hippie ashram. There was no yoga class in a gym with leotards and a rubber mat. So when I got to LA and saw that there was actually yoga studios filled with people lined up listening to someone tell them what to do was a revelation to me. I was like, okay, <laughs> and no offense. It might've been arrogant on my part, but I said to myself, anybody can do this. <laughs> I can memorize a script and tell people what to do. And, uh, and so it was pretty obvious right away that acupuncture, however intriguing and more formal and more deep in its philosophy and technique and teachings than mere Hatha yoga classes, it was just, it was not within my reach financially at that time. But Hatha yoga, not only learning Hatha yoga, but earning a living teaching Hatha yoga, I would have been happy to have a Hatha yoga studio to go to. But then to see that there are studios down there and they're teaching Hatha yoga classes and they're being paid was like, what? <laughs> so I ended up staying there. I mean, there was a, there's a bit more to tell, but it's just boring to anyone except me. I ended up staying there for 13 years. I was going to go down for just look around, see if I'm going to go to acupuncture school and take some yoga classes. And I ended up staying for 13 years teaching yoga. Wow. It's interesting in your story how you were talking about this sort of acupuncture yoga, acupuncture yoga, weighing the two, because that I've literally just gone through that. Um, <laughs> having moved in my, my, I did mine in my 40s, not my 20s. Uh, moved to this this little magical island that I'm on. And when I was moving, was like, well, if there's ever a time to go back to school, when you have no clients and no work, now seems like it would be the time. And so that was exactly my conundrum too, was mm -hmm. yoga therapy, acupuncture, yoga therapy, acupuncture. And I ended up doing some of both, but I only made it to about year two and a half, almost three in acupuncture before I realized that although I absolutely love the medicine and have experienced so much healing from it, which is why I was interested in it. Um, I didn't love needling. Like I, it wasn't gross. It wasn't weird. It wasn't scary. It was just, and since I already had something that I loved and adored that I was doing for an occupation, I was like, I'm too old to just go to school, accrue more and more debt, more and more stress, go through hefty licensing exams for meh. So yes. meh. So I took what I learned, you know, it all goes into my, you know, into my yin teacher training and my, my teaching. And so, you know, it was, none of it was wasted, but it was definitely like, let's try this out. And I was like, nope, back over to the yoga. An interesting parallel. It is. It is an interesting parallel. So now you're in LA and you're teaching mm -hmm. yep. you're, you're, you know, before they had uh, those of you who aren't watching the video air quotes, uh, teacher training programs. Um, where you just actually taught what you learned from other teachers and your own practice. Yeah. Um, and then where do you go from there? I know I've only heard little remnants of it. So if I'm jumping too far ahead in the timeline, we can backtrack. But at some point, there's a story with you and some bones. So uh, I would love to hear more about like, where did that like, how did you go from because uh, even in, in Bikram, that's, that's still quite a um, alignment barking at you style of yoga um very much one size fits all everybody must do this kind of you know vibe um and you're very far removed from that now so where did the transition go from sort of that 
was it starting with your own body and noticing things or seeing things in your students that didn't make sense? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I didn't discover the bones, you know, it, the origin story I've just told you on, you know, only goes up to 1994, okay. 93. That's when I moved. But in that time, and I only taught at Bikram Studio for about a year and a half, two years. And then we had a big fight. Not hard to imagine why. And uh, and it's like, okay, I'm never going back to that studio again. And that's when I had to start teaching on my own. And parallel with teaching on my own was running into other people like uh, Larry Payne down in Marina Del Rey and others who you know came from completely different yogic traditions. And so I'm out here teaching on my own, teaching for other people and, and poking my head on other people's classes. And I thought, oh, there's, there's more to life out here. And so what I did was I took Iyengar's book, the silver book that I reshelved originally because I wasn't interested in doing all those contortions. Well, now I was interested. Now I was like, okay, I'm out here on my own. I don't, I don't pretend to be teaching Bikram yoga anymore. I don't lean on anyone for authority. I've got to learn to be even better at these poses. And, you know, you got to remember, I was working four to six hours a day doing asana for two years. And I'm 20 years old, not 50, not 60. I'm 20 years old working, you know, 24 hours of poses a week, thinking that, you know, I, I got to open up my body. I got to open up my body. I got to, at that point, it was just for my own personal satisfaction. But now there was the fear of God mixed into it that it's like, well, if I'm going to continue to teach and earn money, you know, I need to be able to impress people with my foot behind my head or something. And so I started exploring other things and I took the Iyengar book and took it down and I broke it down. I went to the back of the book and I looked at his three year cycle of poses in the back. And I just wrote down and wrote out, how does he progress these postures over a period of three years? And I'd had enough anatomy back in Montana and enough kinesiology at UCLA when I could get into a class while I was teaching that I could understand the logic behind why this post before that post, that post before that post, that post before that post. And so I did that. And while I was doing it, I was practicing those sequences. So that was a, you know, two years with Bikram, two years doing that in my own explorations. And then I met David Williams, the Ashtanga yoga teacher. He was in transition from one home to another in his little town in Hawaii. And literally that little town in Hawaii where he wanted to live was so small that the chances of you finding a place to live was about this much. So when he was losing the rent on one place, he had to kill like three or four months before he could get into one of the few available places. So he came to LA to teach because he had students there and he taught Ashtanga. And so I'd already been doing two years of my own exploration through other books and other people's classes, just picking and choosing putting them into my repertoire and teaching them as I understood them. And then I met David. And in six weeks time, he taught us everything that we could absorb. There was a cohort of us, you know, Steve Ross and others. And we just, it was like, okay, David's here. He's never from Hawaii. Let's just uh, rock and roll. And David thing was not this, okay, maybe I'll give you one pose more in a week as you slowly progress. He would teach you as many poses as you could memorize and do. And so in six weeks time, we went up through third series. And then he, you know, got into his house and left. And I continued to exercise and explore in the Ashtanga style. But just like other people like uh, Johnny Kest, Brian Kest, people in the L.A. area, you learn right away that Ashtanga jump back, jump through is for the elite, elite physically and the elite who could spend the time doing it don't have a job and a kid. And so what you do is you take out the jump back sequence and you just have a flow. And that's when you started to have this multiplicity of names of yoga. You couldn't call it Ashtanga because you weren't doing the jump back, jump through thing. So it was flow yoga, power yoga, vinyasa yoga. Everyone made up a name to indicate we're gonna be doing strong, hard, sweaty, linked together poses. And I was one of those guys. You know, yeah, this is great. 
And uh, so that took me from 86 to about 88. I'm still in LA. Now that's been now it's been eight years, ten years of doing yoga. And I, there's still tons of poses I can't do, can't even get close to. And I did Bikram's advanced classes three times a week, and I done now been doing Ashtanga for you know years. And because of my experience and my understanding of anatomy and kinesiology, it was very easy for me to coach other people into this. Oh, you need to move your elbow to here. But I couldn't do many of those advanced poses. I could coach them. I could, I could tell you what to do. But it's like, man, I, I can't do it. And of course, no one by that time had ever said skeletal variation, tension, or compression. It was, you need to open up. You need to hold Mula Bandha. You know, all these things that you hear that later is just laughable. But at that time, I'm going like, okay, you know, and I'm working hard. I'm sore every day. I remember like, even though I'm in my 20s, I wake up sore every day. Just like, oh, not a bad way. Just like, you know, if you're a gym rat, you wake up, oh, my quads, oh, my back, you know. It wasn't like ruin your life sore. It was like, oh, man, really working out a lot. And that's when I saw Polly Zink on a public access television show. And here's this quiet little guy. Polly's only like five, six or something. And he was being interviewed, and he was being interviewed on a martial arts public access show. And so at first I was like, oh, you know, it's a martial arts show. This is interesting. I was about to flip the channel. And then the guy asked Polly, and how is it that you're, you know, you stay so flexible to do your martial arts? He says, well, it's my yoga. And I sort of, what? And he went on to talk about his martial arts that he did. And he was like a two-time world champion in the martial art form that he does. I mean, he can move or could then. I'm sure he does, does now too. He could move beautifully. He did a little demonstration at the end of the show. I didn't know who he was, but he talked. He constantly deflected these questions that were softball questions from this interviewer. Tell us why you're so wonderful. Tell us why your uh, Kung Fu is so magnificent. And he would very humbly and very honestly divert it into, well, you know, I just train regularly. I train hours every day. It's not something you can achieve right away. And you must do your yoga. You must do your yoga. You, mu you must balance movement with, you must keep your body open. And that just impressed me to no end. One was this guy, and I don't mean to deride the interviewer. The, the interviewer was obviously overawed by Polly, that he was talking to Polly Zink. And he was just like, oh, you're, you know, tell us about. And he was just very humble in his responses and very pragmatic and very practical. And what I got from it, I mean, this is maybe a 30 minute public access show, I don't remember, was that he described, well, what I do, and he probably grabbed his leg and held it up by his ear. <laughs> you know, you know, I take a pose like this and you really got to relax and go into it for many, many minutes at a time. And that's the first I had heard of it in many years. If I take you back to my origin story, that very simple book that I started with, Yoga and Health, you actually held your those postures for minutes at a time. But through the Bikram years and the Astanga years, it was all just huff and puff and jump and sweat. And all of a sudden, this that voice of him saying, well, you just have to hold it for minutes at a time. It's like this bell went off. And I go... Ever since I stopped doing that, picked up Bikram's book, went on to Bikram's class, went on from there to Ashtanga, I've been doing what I would now call Yang Yoga. I didn't have that language yet, but I, Yang Yoga. And now he's talking about something that I dimly remember a long time ago, holding it for a long time. And Polly, if you've ever seen him, he's extraordinary, at least in his hips and his legs, he's extraordinarily flexible. And so my mind was, maybe this wise, after eight, 10 years of hard work, I can't do what my own advanced students can do. Because everything I've been doing is varieties of yang. Here's something very, very different. And so I studied with him for about a year. I contacted the, the uh, public access show. I go like, how can I get a hold of this guy, Polly Zink? And, and he lived... Uh, if you don't know the LA area, you know, LA is just unbelievably vast. 
but he happened to live in a suburb of LA, a section of LA that was about a 45 minute hour drive by freeway to get to him. I lived in Santa Monica and he lived in Burbank. Mm. And so once a week I'd drive out and spend two hours, two and a half, three hours. I just remember they were long classes. I was used to like 90 minute class, get in, get out, people are busy. Polly was a throwback. Polly was in his garage, literally, motorcycle over there. Spread some cardboard on the floor so that you don't, you know, get your clothes dirty. And he and four or five people would just do their yoga in this very humble setting. And you do what we now call yin yoga for about, you know, it wasn't rigid, but like an hour, 90 minutes, somewhere in there. And then you'd come up and he, you'd do his movements, his punches, his kicks, his walks and spins. And that was his balance. That was his yin and yang. I don't remember if he called it yin yoga and yang yoga, but that's the language we would use today. And I was incredibly impressed by him. I was impressed by how open he was to letting people come study with him, um, how unpretentious he was. You know, I'd seen abusive teachers, not going to name names, but they're pretty obvious. And just to see how welcome he was, how kind he was. Uh, he didn't hold back any secrets. He didn't pretend, you know, I was like, well, maybe someday I'll tell you, you know, <laughs> this is it. This is what I do. It's like, it's hard work and you got to do it a lot. And so that was really refreshing. That was really refreshing to see. David Williams was like that too. David Williams was very humble, wasn't trying to hold anything back, wasn't trying to build a mystique around himself, but he taught Ashtanga. And so Polly said, like, oh, here's another guy who's who's a genuinely good person and is a true yogi. I mean, he worked out hours every day and for years by himself. Throwback to the old time. So I was deeply impressed with him. But, uh, you know, after going out there, you know, his class would start eight o'clock at night, I think, or 730 at night, whatever. You know, and I'm working and teaching all day long and driving for an hour through LA traffic and then doing two or three hours of that and then driving home, getting home at midnight. It was like, oh man, this is tough. But what was great about it is that even though it was only about a year, I'm guessing 88, sometime in 1988 to 89, it was obvious by then because Polly was so humble and straightforward about it. There's no magic here. It's not a mula bunda breath or something. It's you just got to keep doing this. You got to relax into it. If that variation doesn't work, do it this way, you know, just do it. And I go, I go like after, you know, 30, 40 sessions with him in a year, you go like, okay, I get it. I've been doing yoga for 10 years. I know anatomy and physiology. He's being very forthright. It's not magic. It's not a secret. It's this is what it takes to do these poses. So I just said to him, I tried to bring him over to what we call the West Side in, a, in L.A. I tried to bring him over to teach so I didn't have to do the drive. It was purely selfish. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't having it. You know, he liked his life and stuff. So I said, OK, thanks, Polly. And so I started I was teaching yin yoga by then. That's what I started. I called it Taoist yoga at the time because he called it Taoist yoga. And I kept doing that. And that's 1988. 10 years later, now I'm 20 years into yoga. I'm 10 years after I met Polly. And even after 10 years of doing yin yoga, you know, three sets of 10 minute splits, you know, two sets of this, there are still a ton of postures I couldn't do. I could coach you into them. I could tell you how to do them. I can't do them. And uh, now we're up to the question that you asked. I hope this hasn't been too tedious. Not at all. Not at all. Um, so I'm in this little town, but, you know, it's by no coincidence. Every town that Susie and I have lived in has a university in it. You know, we're both sort of, you know, academic knuckleheads in a way. And so I went one time, literally, I went to help a friend um, down at the local college here that has a nursing program. And so a nursing program has anatomy and physiology and all that kind of stuff in it. Well, his teacher, my friend's teacher, was retiring, and my friend was going to go help this teacher pack up all of his anatomy books and all of his stuff 
and retire from teaching anatomy to nursing students. So I said, oh, I'll come with you. And while we're going through boxes and emptying bookshelves and, hey, what do you want me to do with this or that? I pull open a box out of a bin and there's human bones in there. And I pull them out. And there was like three femur bones and a couple other random bones. But these three femur bones, I laid them out on a table because I was just completely intrigued. And they were as different as a Great Dane to a Chihuahua, both in size and proportion and the angle of inclination of the femur, the size of the head of the femur, and in every way they were different. Why he had just those three bones in a box, I have no idea, at least I don't remember. But before I said, hey, well, what do you want me to do with this? I just stared at those bones and something in my brain went click, 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 click. We're not all the same skeletally. We're not all the same skeletally. And I hadn't yet come up with the idea, of my catchphrase is tension, compression, skeletal variation. When I die, I want those three words on my tombstone. Tension, <laughs> compression, skeletal variation. Because they're interrelated. And um, it was at that point that was the beginning of the bones are different. What difference would it make? The bones are different. What difference would it make? And that's when I, I can't remember the exact moment, but it was like, the bones are different means they're going to hit. They're going to compress at a different angle of movement. The bones will compress. Compression is different than tension. And that was it. Compression is different than tension, just for your audience. Compression is different <laughs> than tension. And, and this uh, was not being talked about. No. And the yoga that was being taught was very one size fits nobody, <laughs> really. You know, it was very <laughs> like, very like, this is how you do this pose safely. Yeah. Um, and and I understand that the reason that that, that a lot of those things were taught that way was under the guise of safety, under not understanding, like you said, that different people are built differently. Um, and of course, I think oftentimes, especially when teachers are new, they tend to just parrot what their teacher said without stopping to question ever, like what their teacher said. Um, and that being said, not all teachers are okay with being questioned. Um, <laughs> You are very much so. I've, I mean, that is one of the reasons I think I alluded to at the beginning that you're one of the few people that I call my teacher. And uh, you and Susie have a unique ability to be highly um, educated, wise, and informed, and humble and open and hilarious as a side note for anyone, for anyone who hasn't hung out with the two of you. Um, so I think that, you know, probably generations of teachers were saying all of these alignment rules just because their teacher said it and their teacher said it and without ever stopping to go, but is that actually true? And back at the time when, even when your DVD presentation came out, that was still not being talked about. So how did you get from like, you found the bones. So I'm imagining that now you're starting to incorporate this aha into your body and then looking at your students and going, oh, hmm, now I can see in them. And where did it go from kind of there to like creating the DVD that has changed so many of our lives as teachers? Uh, you know, I can't quite remember how far I had gotten uh, before I made the DVD, but I used to travel with bones. What I did was I'd drive down to Berkeley, California, and there was a natural, uh, what do they call it? Um, it's a store that sells fossils and snakes and agates. I forget what it was called. But they had a collection of, of uh, human bones that were literally just broken down and, and kept in, in cardboard boxes because no one wanted them. And, uh, you know, like a box of ribs. What are you going to do with a box of ribs? I mean, they're not, you didn't even know which ribs went to which skeleton and a box of half of a pelvis and another box full of half a pelvis and a box of just sacrums. Because once someone had bought a skull, no one else was interested in the rest of the skeleton. 
<laughs> true. Yeah. So literally, I would call this guy up. I wish I could remember the name of the place. I'd call him up and say, hey, I'm coming down. I'm driving down. I'm going to be there for a day. You know, can I take a look at the bones and sift through them and, and pick a few out? And so I did that a couple of times and I got a collection of uh, humerus bones, femur bones, bones of the pelvis. And uh, I could see then how, you know, if you had a different shaped bone and you move your pelvis for some person like you, when they try to do the side bending pose, the tilt of the pelvis is going to hit. Whereas in someone else, the tilt of the pelvis would not create a compression. That went pretty fast because I had very good training in, in uh, kinesiology and anatomy. I didn't get degrees in those subjects, but I, I understood all the basics of it, how to analyze the body, which joints, what are the joints, how are the joints constructed, you know, what is a hip, you know, people have all kinds of definitions of what is a hip or what is a shoulder. Whereas for me, because of the benefits of my education, I could, you know, I could look at and see, well, I can see, you know, well, how the bones in that shoulder uh, should or could or would articulate differently. And so it was pretty quick. I can't remember when we made the DVD video, but I think it was 2003 or four. I don't think it was 2006. And that was just from 1998 till then. I had already developed a repertoire and taught classes using those bones and those images. Um, so... It was a pretty quick uh, leap to um, being able to demonstrate that different bones would hit and, and create compression. Um, and by the time I was giving a demonstration, again, I can't remember exactly when that first one came out, but by the time I gave a demonstration on that DVD, I, I mean, by the time we made that DVD, I'd already had in the can, so to speak, a series of demonstrations that I had worked up for doing these weekend workshops. Mm -hmm. And I imagine at the time though, when you were doing these weekend workshops that you would be, um, I would imagine you got a lot of blowback and a <laughs> lot of, um, and, and also a lot of yoga teachers kind of, I remember very clearly in the workshop that I took with you when I first met you, I remember Susie saying, because I think she looked out at the room and there was, um, ironically in that training, there was a bunch of Iyengar teachers mm -hmm. and a bunch of those of us that were Iyengar trained, but weren't Iyengar certified teachers. Um, and I think, I don't know if it was that she looked out into the, the faces of the room and saw it, or if it's something she always said, but I remember her saying, you know, if you feel like the yoga mat has literally been pulled out from underneath you, like, just, you know, just know that that's pretty normal kind of thing. And I do remember, like, there was a couple of us. I remember one of my friends specifically who, um, and we were in teacher training together when she did uh, dragonfly, couldn't fold forward at all. And, and, and you workshopping it with her and it was, it was her bones. And I remember the relief on her face when she was like, oh my gosh. Like, so I can just let go of ever being good at this pose and, you know, just focus on the other 900 yoga poses or whatever. And I felt that same relief when I was finally able to turn my feet out in saddle and not have somebody coming and standing over me, you know, worried about my knees. Um, so I, I would imagine that in, in these groups, when you're teaching them, that you would have kind of a combination of people going, this explains everything and people going, nope, nope, nope this you know this is this you can't shift this paradigm for me it's it's too much oh yeah definitely yeah um yeah I ran into it myself you know many times fortunately by the time I showed up at a studio most of the people knew what I was about you know if you're going to be offended you probably weren't there Mm -hmm. but yeah it got it, the, I can remember a student coming up to me one time which would summarize this as she came up to me one time says, you know, I'm so glad I came to the, to your workshop. Oh, well, good. Yeah. Thanks. I'm glad you came. She says, yeah. You know, I told my, my teacher um, that I was going to come do your workshop and she just sort of froze. <laughs> and then she said to me, and I'm quoting, she said to me, okay, you can go, but don't talk about it in the studio when you get back. Whoa. I'm not making that up. You can go, first of all, like she needs that teacher's permission to go to a exactly. workshop. Exactly. 
Exactly. But don't talk about it. Don't talk about it in the studio when you get back. Wow. So, and yeah. Because then people... that would mean that all of the students would then be questioning the directions they were given. I remember when I studied with you and then came back after that summer and taught um, something as simple as Tadasan and no longer told people they had to put their feet together. And just something that simple that I learned in your workshop and through the DVD just changed that one simple pose and, and just said, you know, stand with your feet at comfortable distance apart where you feel stable. And that was how I taught it from then on. And I remember one of my students who, who actually is originally from India saying to me, you used to tell us, you know, why, like to put our feet together here. And now you're not saying that anymore. Why is that? And I said, oh, because I just, you know, did some continuing education. And I realized that not everybody can do that. Like I wasn't, I wasn't so attached, I guess, to having done it that way. And that I, I couldn't let it go. And then I think the other thing is that, um, I think sometimes teachers are afraid to admit that they either don't know something or that they've taken in new information. And now that they're, they've approached that with critical thinking that their opinion has changed, um, which is uh, unfortunate, I think, because I think that's where all this kind of dogmatic stuff comes in. If you can't, you know, sit with yourself and kind of question your previous information based on the new information you've brought in. I mean, that's just so, it's so rigid, but I, but I experience it, it in the, you know, in the teaching community. So I'm sure um, it's less so now when I teach teachers, um, your original DVD presentation is um, pre-homework for all of the teachers that I train. Um, because, because to be honest, there's, especially when I'm doing online trainings, I can't do that in a more cohesive way than is presented in that. Um, I've tried doing some of the kind of like, let's all look at each other's bodies that you do when we do your trainings. But what I have found is that, especially in small groups, everyone's kind of generally in the middle. Like it's hard to find these kind of extremes on either side that you so clearly demonstrate in the DVD. And so that's why it's prescribed watching before we even start. And then they do, they have some reflection questions and then we do questions and stuff like that. But, and so I, I don't get as much of it now, but when I first started trying to explain to teachers that like, this might not actually be the case, you know, maybe it's not just that my hips were too tight for extended side angle pose. Like it's possible there was something else going on there. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was challenging. It was like affronting, you know. Well, you know, no, no, in my experience, no field of human endeavor is free of that. Not scientists, not mathematicians, certainly not theologians, not religious scholars. It's like, and we're trapped by our ideas. And, you know, it's one thing to be able to entertain a, a contrary idea and maybe not agree, but you entertain it. And it's another thing to not listen to another idea. Right. You know, to say to someone, you know, over and above, who are you to give me permission? I'm not asking your permission. It's like, okay, you can go, but right. don't talk about it. Can you imagine anybody else in any other field of, of uh, study where you would tolerate that? You would tolerate some secular person telling you what you can or cannot talk about? Like, Wow. And that's just, I think that, um, like I said, it's not unique to yoga, but um, yoga, yoga as it gets closer and closer to uh, religious uh, practice and belief, you start to slide away from a critical objective thinking and maybe it's wrong to who am I to question. And I think that uh, that's just sad. I believe that even the deepest and most dearly held religious and philosophical beliefs, you should be able to question them. Even if, even if to admit, you know, I, I don't, I really can't justify, you know, why it just makes sense to me. It feels good to me. And that's why I believe what I do. At least that would soften your attitude and your opinion towards others who don't believe the way that you do, Agreed. but it's not unique to yoga. Um, 
you know, this resistance, particularly if you have a black belt in some style of yoga that insists it has to be done a certain way, because now much more is on the line than changing your mind. Right. But now it's your your ability to earn a living and shamefacedly admitting that everything you've been insisting on for a number of years is wrong. I've met people who can do that. I've I've met um, in my ramblings, I've come across some people where I walked into a studio, did a presentation, and you could feel the tension in the room because the studio owner who invited me was here and all of the people he's trained and worked for him are here. And they're literally like looking sideways over at the teacher. And then, but that's not how we do it here. And this teacher said, without a moment's hesitation, it impressed the hell out of me, said, well, that's the way we're going to do it now. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, the studio so, that I took your initial workshop in was, was an Ashtanga studio, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think so that was right. 2007, uh, I believe. And I actually only knew that because Susie remembered when I yeah. met you in person for the first time after that at, at a training. I said, yeah. yeah, I did a workshop with you in Calgary. And I was like, I can't remember what year. And she's like, Calgary, 2000. I was like, wow, that's a memory. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then you started doing yin at the time you were calling it Taoist yoga, because that's yep. what Polly called it. When did it move into to yin yoga? It moved into yin yoga when I uh, wrote my first book, which was, I think, 2002. Before that, I had a spiral bound manual, or I still called it Taoist yoga. But that was just something I would give to students, you know, in class when we're working out together. But when it got to you're going to publish this and you're going to circulate it to a wide audience, you may never meet them ever. That's when it really sort of sunk into me that, you know, it's really not Taoist yoga. It's not, it doesn't have a yin element and a yang element. It's not the way Polly taught me. And so I thought, well, to be more precise, on what this book is about, we'll use the word yin yoga because Sarah Powers was already, you know, exclusively referring it to it as yin yoga. And so I said, and that's starting to get around, you know, she's introducing it. So people are starting to get familiar with that. So I said, well, that's a good, that's a very good description of it. Mm -hmm. So that happened. The name change happened 2002 when I published a book intended for the general public. By that time, I had already been teaching that style of yoga for 14 years. So the yin it's, yoga is what it is now. It, it had been that way since I started teaching. I mean, it, all of us, you know, we sort of slowly find our own voice and our own style. But basically, basically unchanged uh, for 14 years. But just the name changed. Right. And part of that was because I had met Dr. Motiyama and had been studying and studying you know his works and stuff and learning about fashion it's uh and its relationship to meridian theory and chinese medicine so now i'm back to that original reason i went to la i was like was it going to be chinese medicine or is it going to be yoga how and did you meet Dr. him dr motiyama was 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 providing me with a theoretical explanation as to why yin yoga has different effects on the body than yang yoga. Not better effects, not superior effects, different effects on the body. And Dr. Motiyama's uh, teachings, as I have slowly absorbed them over the years, made that very clear that now there's also a physiological explanation as to why the rebound from a yin practice is different, not superior, different from the rebound from a yang type of exercise practice. And so all of those, when I wanted to fuse both of those into a book, even though, you know, I had to tone down how much fascia meridian theory I could do in that little book. In my mind, I thought I was making a contribution by saying there is a reason, there's now a reasonable explanation as to why you would want to pull and sustain tension on your fascia now. 
because I used to get blowback all the time how it's totally dangerous to stretch your ligaments. You're going to die. And so the book was two things. I changed the name because I thought it's more accurate a description. And I introduced for, I believe, the first time to the public um, that I was speaking to the idea of what is fashion, what are meridians, and how might they be related to this practice. So the publication of the book was a, was a milestone of publicly putting out there stuff that I had already been doing for well over a decade. How did you meet? I know you obviously found his books first, but then how did you actually meet Dr. Mochiyama? I was, uh, I was doing one-on-one -on -one yoga work with people. And um, it was essentially, I was doing assisted yoga on them. I pulled them and hold them and, you know, you have two or three minutes to talk. And so you go like, hey, how you doing these days? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, you're a little tight here. Yeah, I know. Okay, well, just breathe into it. And while I was pulling and working on someone, I said, yeah, I've been reading a book, a fascinating book about chakra theory and yoga theory. And normally I don't pay much attention to those books because I don't trust the sources that they're derived from. But this guy, he's really like very scientific. He's got two PhD degrees. I've never heard of him before. But this book called Theories of the Chakras is really opening my eyes to the relationship between Chinese medicine meridians and yoga, which all of us sort of felt there had to be a connection. But he was really spelling it out. It was very exciting to me that these two uh, threads from way back in my life were like starting to overlap. And she goes, huh. Yeah, that guy sounds like someone my friend studied with. Mm. <laughs> and I'm in L.A. working on this girl, you know, in, in the back room of my house where I had a studio big enough for one person, two people. And she, this girl was from Martha's Vineyard. And the friend that she knew was someone she met on Martha's Vineyard. And it turned out that she, her name was Randy Brown. Randy had translated Dr. Motoyama's earlier book into English. She had studied with Dr. Motoyama for, I think, seven years or 10 years in Japan. Wow. And I said, I would love to talk to her because I didn't even know this guy was alive. You got to remember, this is pre-internet, people. Those of you who are listening, <laughs> you couldn't like, I think I'll jump on the internet and find out who this guy is. That didn't exist. So it's like, you know, the fact that this one girl of the 12 million people in L.A. happened to be friends back across the country with the one woman who had studied with Dr. Motoyama, English speaker in Japan, was a pretty heady coincidence. And then the coincidence gets bigger. I call her and we speak and she says, well, you should know that Dr. Motoyama is coming to Southern California because he's looking to establish a graduate school there and he wants to shop for the appropriate location. You might get a chance to see him. And that did happen. And that was 1988, 1989, somewhere in there. And I went down and I met him. And uh, he was very generous with his time. And, you know, uh, a year later, I went to Japan and studied a little bit with him there and went to their, their ashram that they have. And um, I continued to, Susie and I both continued to visit, meet with him a couple times in Japan. We went there to visit. And most frequently when he would come to Southern California to administer and look after the affairs of the graduate school that he had established there, he would find time in his very, very busy schedule to meet with us. And so that's how Dr. Motoyama came about. I read his book, and then I was fortunate enough to get an introduction uh, by Randy Brown, whom he respected deeply. I was fortunate enough to get an introduction to meet him. And I was also fortunate that he was coming to the United States on a regular basis because of this graduate school. He was coming twice a year. He and Mrs. Motoyama would come twice a year to look in, get this school going. And it gave us extraordinary access to him. Because in Japan, you couldn't get a meeting with Dr. Motoyama unless you requested it ahead of time. And then you'd be and then you'd be told, well, if you do these and these and these preparatory exercises spiritually and fasting and stuff, then you can have a meeting with him. We could just call up and make an appointment if he was in town. It's amazing. Because there was no there weren't any huge demands on his time once his 
once his day of looking into the administration was done. So uh, looking back on it, it was an extraordinary, uh, one of the most extraordinary um, relationship opportunities that I've had in my life, certainly. Mm -hmm. And like you were, I think, hinting at perhaps that this uh, so-called coincidence, um, <laughs> you know, which I don't believe in, but that's probably a topic for another time. Um, yeah, that you just happen to be working with the friend of, I mean, when these yeah. things happen, I just think it's got to be more to it than coincidence, obviously. Um, yeah. Even my my going to your first workshop after having your DVD, I walked by a studio I would never go in because it was an Ashtanga mm. studio. Mm. I just happened to go in to see if they had a yoga bolster I could buy for a friend's birthday. Mm -hmm. And there was your poster, right? Like had I said, had I just kept walking to a different studio, who knows how how and when if I would have studied with you at all in Yin, you know? Mm. I'm sure eventually I would have found it because I just believe that it was meant to be that way, but interesting stuff. So the last time that I saw you, you were still running teacher trainings, but you had changed them a bit. I think you had just let go of, it was the year that you were like, this is the last time that you can come if you want Yoga Alliance um, stamps yeah. on your things. Um, and uh, that was the last one. That's not why I came because I don't really give a crap about Yoga Alliance. Um, I'm not registered with them. Don't want to be, don't care to be. Um, so that wasn't the, the thing for me. I was just like, oh, I still have the funds while I'm studying Chinese medicine and taking yoga therapy. I actually scraped together the money. I'm going to go, you know, um, I used uh, like sort of elective credits to skip the yin section in the yoga therapy program, um, right. you know, and then just came to California and hung out with you. So that was kind of, I think, what you were doing up until the big bad pandemic. And then now everything of course is different. So what are you, what are you doing now as far as trainings and stuff like that? Uh, we don't do many trainings anymore. The pandemic, you know, we were on a, uh, a course of, of slowly um, teaching less. We had already surrendered our, um, as you mentioned, uh, we already had surrendered our licensing uh, accreditation with Yoga Alliance. We, I think the only thing we have remaining now via Yoga Alliance is that if you need CEU continuing education units, I think that we are still a provider for that. But the idea of doing 100 hour programs, such as you participated in, mm -hmm. and then accumulating uh, units with us, and then we can submit on your behalf accreditation to Yoga Alliance, we don't do that anymore. And uh, we don't do very much um, because of that, the, all the technical things that we've been discussing today, you know, tension, compression, skeletal variation, we don't do that very much anymore. Um, we have people like you uh, and we've generated and created enough resources like the DVD that you mentioned and a, a bigger streaming online project um, from Pranamaya. Yeah, the longer course. All yeah. the basics of anatomy and and yoga. So we're just fresh from the pandemic, and so our plan is that we'll we'll occasionally do um, uh, workshops, but they're all going to be philosophical and meditative. Now, it's all going to be about you know Patanjali's Yoga Sutras or the Bhagavad Gita, its philosophy. Um, and uh, part of that is because we have old friends, uh, much like yourself, people that we have had the pleasure to work with over the years who came from all parts of the world to, um, to learn about a scientific rational approach to yoga. And, we've, uh, and we like to hang out with them and we like, and they know us, they know our approach. And it would be really sad to not be able to see them again or hang out with them and discuss these, these more philosophical and spiritual points. It's just that it's nothing that lends itself to a program. It's nothing that lends itself to, here, I'm gonna teach you how to do chakra meditation so you can go home and teach it. It, it doesn't have that uh, flavor anymore. It's just a question of, let's be serious about what we're doing. Let's be systematic in our study. Let's break Patanjali down 
step by step and really dig into him. But it's really as, as, as like colleagues and cohorts of we don't get much of an opportunity to talk seriously and in a prolonged day by day development of these ideas. And we're all getting older and we're all doing yoga. And I don't need to go see Paul and Susie to hear one more time what tension, compression, and skeletal variation is. But it'd be nice to take a week and meditate two, three times a day, have a nice yoga practice, and have a mature and sane discussion of philosophy. So we sort of we're, we're kind of in the business of going from TT programs to meditation retreat programs. Beautiful. And I think you've already created um, through your many, many years of training teachers. I always think of us as like, you know, we all kind of came as came in as caterpillars. And then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> through through studying with you, you know, we eventually bloom and we become butterflies and then we go and and you know spread the good word, of course, with always with our own perspective on it. Um one of the things that I, I wanted to uh, to mention um, is this, we've, we've touched on it already, this kind of sense of, of being dog, dogmatic in yoga. And one of the things I've always appreciated about you as a, as a teacher and as a human is that I've, cause I've come to you, I think twice, one that I can think of offhand with kind of like, uh, I'm a little bit perplexed because this is what I'm learning and studying, but then also I love yin, but like, how do I mesh these? And one of the times was the last time that I saw you and I, I came and I said, you know, I'm, I'm studying yoga therapy and actually a big basis of yin yoga is incredibly complementary with yoga therapy because it's acknowledging individuals and individual needs, which is a big premise in yoga therapy that like, we're looking at the individuals and like, what are their needs? Um, but the some of the languaging that I was taught in yin was starting to feel like it didn't mesh and I remember coming to you and just saying like some of the words they aren't resonating and especially if I want to teach from a trauma-informed way and I remember you looking at me so matter-of-factly and just saying well you should use whatever words work for you and your students <laughs> like just like just like that you know and I was like Right, right, right. You're not attached to any of this. Okay. Um, you know, which, which I, I just, the reason I want to bring that up is because I find that, and you probably don't know because you're smart enough not to be online a lot, but that even within yin yoga communities, this sense of sort of dogmatism can come in um, where, you know, somebody will ask a question on a Facebook forum and and, you know, and I'm sure at some point I'll talk to Bernie and I'll be able to pick his brain about like why people are quoting him. I'm guessing either inaccurately or not complete with the complete picture, but they get a hold of like a little nugget of information and then they just cling to it. And then it's like everybody that doesn't do it this way is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes up a lot. One of the things that you did also was that you refused to trademark yin yoga as a tm style of yoga um which i always see as like the benefit and the you know the deficit to that the benefit is um i don't think people yoga should be trademarked i think that's ridiculous frankly but because you've done that and you've said you know you don't need to have like formal yin yoga training to teach yin yoga there has been a bit of a kind of wild wild west within um within yin because everybody can call anything, anything they want. Um, and for the most part, it, it tends to be, you know, pretty cohesive, but there are these kind of elements where you hear things like, um, for example, you can't use props in yin yoga. And I've just been like, having studied with you with Susie <laughs> and used all the props I've wanted the whole time, just been like, um, where, where did that come from? Like who's teaching that? Cause it's not you. Um, and I think sometimes people misunderstand, um, you know, because in the book there aren't props. So they assume that that means you can't use props. And it's like, or sometimes people assume as soon as you pull a, a meditation cushion or a yoga bolster off the shelf, you're suddenly doing restorative yoga. It's like, no, I'm getting comfortable. Like, you know, I'm getting comfortable so that I can focus on this area that I'm supposed to be, you know, working within this shape. Um, so that's one thing that um, I always think comes up. 
And the other thing that comes up often is this idea that yoga, yin yoga must be done on cold tissues. I don't know where this is coming from. I'm guessing because people quote Bernie. And again, when I talk to Bernie, I'll ask him about this because if they are quoting him, I'm sure he's like, what? That's not what I said. And I often think of it sort of like the, that game that we played as kids, the telephone game where you sit in a circle and then like you whisper a sentence to your friend. And by the time it gets back to you, you're like, I did not say that. That is not even close. So it might be the case of the telephone game. I'm guessing it's a, you don't need to do warm ups to practice yin yoga. And that somehow got turned into, you can't do yin yoga on warm tissues. But I thought I would just kind of run that by you um, because I know when we study with you, there were times where we started in yin and then ended in yang. There were times where we started in yang and ended in yin. And there was never this sort of dogmatic, like, oh no, you're warmed up now. So now you can't do yin. So just thought I would throw that by you and see what you had to say about it. Well, I agree with what you everything you just said. I think it's the telephone game. And I think that um, that there's hard and fast rules like that are almost never applicable uh, universally. And I think it's like you said, you said, well, you don't have to warm up to do yin. In fact, you could make the case, for example, let's be specific. Let's say that uh, you're a real flexible person and you can, doing a forward bend like caterpillar pose, Paschimottanasana is easy for you. Particularly if you're warmed up. Well, if you do caterpillar pose first thing, not warmed up, you're gonna feel it in the tissues and it's gonna have a longer lasting effect on those tissues. Because when if you're a real flexible person in that range of motion, then it could be that when you go forward in a forward bend after you're hot and sweaty, you don't feel anything in those tissues. Mm -hmm. And so you could make the case that if you just want to go by pure definitions, whether or not it's good for you, it's more yin not to warm up a tissue before you stretch it. But then the next question is, but is it better for you? Because the other extreme is like, at least half the population. Hamstring stretches aren't easy. They're never easy. They raises, have a real life. Yeah. Raises their own and, hand. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. they're never going to be easy. And so if you do your hamstring stretches after you're already warmed up, that means you're going to be able to stay in that pose longer at a more extended range of motion. And that will have a longer lasting effect for you. Right. And so here's an advanced person, or it doesn't have to be advanced. It's a skeletal. Like my skeleton is the opposite of yours. I, I walk like a duck and sitting between my feet is like, I'll tell you anything you want to know. Just don't make me do it. <laughs> and yes. what I've observed over the years is that someone like me, you walk like a duck. It's, it's easier to stretch your hamstrings and it's harder to stretch your quads. And someone like you is the opposite. That's a generalization. There are always other factors, but, and so it's like, why, why wouldn't we allow you and your body type to get warmed up so that you can get to the limit, safe limit of your range of motion and hang out there and really maybe make a dent that's longer lasting. It's never permanent, but it's longer lasting because you were at your extreme because you got warmed up. Whereas for me, if I'm really warmed up, I don't feel much in my hamstrings. But if I go into it cold, then I don't go as far into the pose. But my awareness of feeling my legs open in and of itself is an absorbing experience. And then I eventually get down to where I was, where I was going to go anyway. And I think that uh, that's just an example of how I agree with you that you throw out, someone asks you a question, you answer the question specific to that person. That person over there heard your answer. And just presume, well, now it's universally applicable. Right. And it's like, I don't think it's a sin. It's just not accurate. And there's really nothing you can do about it. Getting back to your first lead into this. Yeah, it's the wild, wild west. But it's always been the wild, wild west. And even if you said, I, I want to control this so these, this nonsense doesn't seep in, they'll just change the name and spread their own dogma anyway. 
Yeah. They'll call it yo yo yin yoga. And in yo yo yin yoga, we do this way. And then this guy over here will say, no, it's ya ya yin yoga. And in ya ya yin yoga, we do it this way. So it's like you might as well have them all in the same camp because basically, if you're sitting and you're stretching a tissue and you're not putting it under tension, then you're doing yin yoga. So it's not a brand name, it's just a generalization of the general style. And I just don't think you can control um, shallow interpretations or misinterpretations. The answer is that you've already touched upon 15, 20 minutes ago. You need to continue to learn until you die. Mm -hmm. And you need to think and rehearse for that on your deathbed, you might go, oh, I was wrong about that, and then die. Mm -hmm that you need to continue to learn this idea that you learned everything that you needed to know in the sixth grade or by the 12th grade or by college or in a 200 hour teacher training program or in a 12 hour workshop that you took. This is immature. It's not a sin, it's not evil. It's just immature to think that the little catchphrase you picked up it's going to be universally applicable for all time. Maybe it's what you believe now, and it's the best answer that you have. But you know, hopefully, you know, you'll continue to learn and progress, even accidentally. <laughs> even just accidentally run into someone that will actually clarify for you an idea that you have wrong. And I just think that the best thing any of us can do is to rehearse, and I mean this literally, mentally rehearse saying in an instant you're right you're right i was wrong about that mm -hmm. not this fall back into i've got it all now i got it all mm -hmm. in fact i've got it in sanskrit which is <laughs> more than one <laughs> yes yes one of the ways that i do this is especially because i think it's natural as humans when you're affronted with new information especially as, as an introvert, I always need time to kind of chew on things and sit with things before I can verbally respond. So I'll usually say, huh, I hadn't thought of that. You've given me some food for thought. Thank you. Even before I say, you're right, I'm wrong. Cause it's like, maybe yeah. they are, maybe they're not. I don't know. I, have no, to I go think and... that's an excellent response. And I think it's an excellent conscious habit to create is to say, wow, I hadn't thought of that. Even if inside you're thinking this guy's an idiot. Mm-hmm. Or like that's crazy. <laughs> or I'll immediately turn it into asking them for more, more, more questions. You know, exactly. I haven't heard of that. Where did you hear that? Where did you Where learn you that? that? Like, give me yeah. some sources of information. Like I'm, but I'm a very curious person. So I think that's part of it. So yeah, I guess I the answer to, can you do yin yoga on, on hot or cold tissues is like everything in yin, it depends. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I guarantee you that's what Bernie will answer you because in all of yeah. his all of his uh, newsletters, Scott, which are really a great, great resource for the yin community, he always says, it depends, it depends, mm -hmm. it depends. And he's not dodging the issue. He's not dodging the question. He will then go on to elaborate clearly why sometimes this and why sometimes that. And you just have to have, you have to grow into being patient like that. It is a sign of immaturity to insist on a yes or no question. It's mm -hmm. not immature to ask, is it this or is it this? But when someone says, well, it depends, then you gotta like, okay, let me try to understand why it depends. And even if and you look at- that I would throw out to people is like, learn more anatomy. <laughs> learn more about uh, fascia. Go to Gil Headley's channel, go to, the fascia books that are online, go to anatomy things. That should be something that you do on a regular basis if you're involved in a profession that involves anatomy. I mean, I can remember uh, our, our friend and student, uh, Kate, her husband, her, her father was a hand surgeon. And that's what he did for a living. It's like, he might've done some other things, but his specialty was the hand. And she says, I can remember as a girl coming into his study, and, you know, the night before Thursday's operations, you know, with the basic anatomy books of the handout. So he could refresh himself on the structure of the hand in different books because every hand 
was unique. Mm -hmm. And if you go in thinking, oh, I know the nerve is right here. Oops, I just cut the nerve. And so she says that stuck with her her whole life, that she'd go in there. Here's her, here's her father, who is a hand specialist. And on the day before surgery day, Thursdays or whatever it was, he would be reviewing the basic anatomy of the hand. And I just think that, you know, if you teach yoga and you're really interested in it, take a few minutes every week as a discipline to flip open an anatomy book, even if you've done it a hundred times and review, mm -hmm. you know, where do the hamstring muscles attach? You know, I think how many muscles are in the back? You mentioned Gil, and I think he is such a wonderful resource because, um, you know, I've, I, one of the first things I did in the pandemic was start, <laughs> he was putting things online. I was like, yes, please. I'll be watching that. <laughs> um, yeah. and even when you've studied a lot of anatomy, to see it in a book and then to see an actual body and how diff it's, it's like night and day difference. So yeah. highly recommend people check out his work. The other yeah, thing the I wanted to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the other thing I wanted to just touch back on was the, um, you know, warm or cool, because if you even think about yin yang theory, um, you know, yin and yang are so interdependent on each other that like, what is warm? What is cool? You know, it's someone who is from Canada walking in the cold to their yin yoga class versus someone in California ridden their bike to a yin yoga class. Like they're already starting at a different amount of warm and cold. So, yeah. you know, it just seems to me like the point is kind of, you know, again, it depends. Are we going yeah, to say I something said, about I, Gil? I answered that question six, eight months ago or a year, I guess, you know, the pandemic, I can't keep track of time. Right. A similar question is this. And I said, I'll put it to you that anyone in the tropical countries is doing warm yin yoga. Yeah. I've taught in Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 38 degrees Celsius, hundred percent humidity, very different experience than teaching in Canada. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Were you going to say something about Gil? before I brought us oh, back. Oh, I just think that um, the resources available to, to people today, and I sound like an old guy, in my day. Back in my but day. It is, it makes a huge difference. There are things that you that books are wonderful for, but what you just brought up, how you, it's one thing to say, I've looked at the shoulder, this abstract thing that's a drawing in a book. And it's another thing to see, you know, three of them on a table, all completely different. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of good uh, resources on YouTube these days. Gil's an excellent one because mm -hmm. I, you know, I love the guy so much. I just love how he presents. Is but it, I just it, think it's relatively easy for yoga teachers to regularly refresh themselves on anatomy. And that's when your insights will come. And that's when you'll be able to answer for yourself why would I want to do it warm and why would I do it cold? Like, well, look how the difference between the muscle and its tendon. Look at the layers on a joint and then ask yourself these questions. And I just think that, you know, for as long as you're an asana teacher and it's a major component of what you do, I think you should be like Kate Smith's dad. And you should take it upon yourself to review your anatomy all the time. And if the only anatomy you've ever taken was in your you know, very quick overview in your yin yoga teacher training program 10 years ago, that's not adequate. It's not adequate for a doctor and it's not adequate for you as a, as a yoga teacher. If you're trying to talk people into contorted positions, you need to understand anatomy. Mm -hmm. And I think you also need to be open to, and I know that this is big in the yin community, asking your student, well, how does that feel for you? Because even when you understand anatomy, unless you have x-ray vision, you can have some <laughs> ideas about what their, their bones are like, but, and you can definitely, if you're, if you have the skill level and the training, you can move their body with your hands in a way that you can feel when compression hits. But again, still like you, and I know Bernie goes back to this all the time. When people say, am I doing this right? It's like, well, I what are you feeling? Yep. Like, tell me about your inner experience. Yeah. yeah. We used, to, we used to call that narrating. I don't know if we did it when you were with us, but we slowly got it down to exercises where 
the person doing a pose would narrate to her partner, this is what I'm feeling. I feel mm -hmm. it here. Now, when you ask me to move my foot forward, I feel it, it changes to here. And it was practice narrating your experience and practice listening to someone narrate their experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's frustrated some of my students in the past when they've asked me, am I doing this right? And I say, <laughs> well, tell me, tell me what you're feeling and where. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, you know, I mean, they laugh and they're like, right, a teacher. Okay, we got it. Back to myself. Okay. <laughs> Well, this yeah. has been wonderful. And I think I'd love to move into, if you're okay with it, some of the kind of uh, closing questions. Sure. Uh, and uh, some of these are fun and some of them are a little more, you know, heartfelt. Um, so the first one is coffee or tea? Coffee. Okay. <laughs> Even though I'm drinking tea right now, they, it, it depends. Yes, that's my answer too. I'm like, it depends. I have to analyze my needs at the time, what I have coming up, you know. Yes, it depends. Um, favorite ice cream flavor? Chocolate chip. Ooh. Um, one thing people often get wrong about me. That I'm humorless. <laughs> Anyone who studied with you and even for a few minutes could not could not think that, but. Do you have a pop culture vice? Vice? Like a, yeah, like a certain show that like you're obsessed with or like a I, movie I've or a series. I've, I've binge watched certain things. I'm usually two or three years behind the times, but I've binge watched a few shows like, well, everyone watched that two or three years ago. So yeah, every once in a while I get swept up in, in um, something that was on Netflix that people talked about. And I said, well, you know, I'm halfway through it. And I go like, you know, okay, I'll finish it. Yeah. So yeah, I get I get swept up in uh in those mini series kinds of things like the White Lotus thing. I can't nothing comes to mind, but I don't watch them all. But you know, if people talk about them and it's already been going on for a year or two, or you know, like when Wednesday came out, I love that. I thought that was just <laughs> wonderfully done. I still haven't seen it, which is odd because I'm definitely that's right up my alley. Um, but I let go of my Netflix subscription and got like Sundance and some other things. And um, so I'll have to revisit Wednesday. Um, when I'm not practicing yoga, I am. Walking my dog or reading a book. Nice. Nice. One weird fact about you. Oh, weird. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm fairly, uh, an introvert is not the right word. I enjoy speaking with people, but I don't spend much time seeking out company. I'm not antisocial. I just had a, you know, I look at all these books behind me and it's like, if I come into this room with a, literally with a cup of coffee in my hand, sit down, I'm gone for an hour or two. So even though I am very, you know, I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk like we're doing, um, I don't talk that much when I'm not on stage. I would agree with, I, and I do think maybe, maybe, because I am the same. Yeah. Mm. When I'm not teaching, I'm usually fairly inward. Um, and, and for me, it is introversion. I think sometimes people confuse introversion with shyness mm. and you can be very introverted, meaning I recharge my batteries with quiet time alone and not be shy at all, mm. or you could be extroverted and be shy. Who knows? Right. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction. So yeah, yeah. if that's if that's weird, it, it, I don't know if that's weird. It's just it might be unexpected mm -hmm. that someone who can just talk and talk and talk the way that I do spends the bulk of my time not doing that. I get the same feedback often. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm like, no, no, I'm just doing quiet things. They're like, what? Um, okay. What the world needs now is. I think what we just talked about, uh, be, we need to be less certain of our opinions or at least have the humility to go like they are just opinions. The, uh, my opinion could be changed. Mm. Good one. I like it. One thing that I wish people knew about yin yoga. The 
that I think it's I think it's a natural supplement to all forms of yang activity that you don't need to commit yourself to calling yourself a yin yogi where you do 10 hours of yin yoga a day. But you might find it if you're a runner or a basketball player or whatever it is that you do. It's highly probable that it, if you had the time to investigate with a teacher to help you, that there would be two or three postures in the repertoire of yin yoga that might change your world because your body type and your pattern of activity really tightens you up in specific ways. And maybe you don't have the interest to do the whole repertoire for your whole body, but there might be three or four poses that if you really invested 20, 30 minutes a day at those three or four poses, that it would really have a positive influence on you. Nice. I would agree. Um, and then the last question is, is there anything else that I forgot to ask you that you would like to add? Uh, no, I hadn't thought about it. I mean, I I felt like I've been talking about myself and how I came to yoga for 90 minutes. So you know, there's nothing I, I left out. It's, okay. more, it's more than people need to know, probably. Well, I would say that there's a huge student base of your your students and then also students of your student students who will who will love to hear actually your origin story. You'd be surprised mm -hmm. how interesting, how interested yogis are in other yogis' origin stories. It's something that I have I have learned. Yeah. Yeah, you know, now that you put it that way, it does make sense. I mean, if I think of my own teachers, you know, I would be very interested in learning, like, you know, David, how did you get started? Dr. Maltiyama, what was your Mm -hmm. It is sort of a natural interest of how we got to where we're at. Yeah. Well, we'll say our proper goodbyes when I stop recording. But first, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate uh, this. I know that pleasure. this is going to be um, highly listened to by not only your teachers, but also, um, again, like I said, students of your teachers. You know, it's going to anyone who's studied with you has talked about you. So I'm feeling this is going to be. Um, well received and I loved the whole origin story so thank you for humoring me on that even though you were like I don't really know if this is relevant I don't know if it's relevant <laughs> it is relevant thank you so much again we'll say our proper goodbyes in just a moment but um, okay. thank you thank you